Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval Transylvania. We made a first video about the early Middle Ages, at least the first half of the medieval millennium. Today we look at the history um, between the 11th and the 13th century, a region that, as we have already observed, was essentially peripheral to the Kingdom of Hungary and that was also populated by different um, cultures that coexisted and contributed to define the the identity of the region. I also made videos in general about the Kingdom of Hungary, we will we'll come back uh, on that, so we obviously reference Transylvania there from the monarchic uh, side of the story. Today we look instead more at the, uh, of course, of the, the local one, um, in, in this region. That is also a notoriously uh, very well uh, outlined by his geographical features that contributed to somehow shelter it from the surroundings and say making it, as you know, in the 19th century, the actually wrong historical location. Also, of, uh, you know, Vlad Tepes, the, you know, it was actually a Balakian, right? But Transylvania strikes a bit as, in fact, the melange of these, of, of very different populations, including the Shekelis, the this broader, say, it's a central European land, but is open to, to others, to the, to, the, to the south, to the east, and it um, was uh, pretty, pretty tormented, of course, throughout its history, but also developing in more gradual and still... Um, continuous fashion as far as the political compaction of the local communities and identity was concerned. So we have seen that here we uh, we are addressing the birth of also chronologically with the beginning of the Kingdom of Hungary, right? The Grand Principality of the Magyars had existed from essentially the second half of the 9th century and around uh, the year 1000 this, in fact, some of oligarchic possessions were was reorganized right on on the ethnic uh, basis for how now that the Magyar uh, elite had established its control on the pre-existing populations and somehow merged with them as a Christian realm by the most famous uh, Saint Stephen of the Arpa dynasty uh, the fifth descendant of the Grand Prince of Hungary Almos Right, so I discussed this in other videos about Hungary, but we'll um, see something more in depth also about probably the Magyar period in some other videos, hopefully soon. And in the year 1000, Stephen, as already Grand Prince of the Magyars, was recognized by the Roman papacy and also by his brother in law, Henry II, the Holy Roman Emperor as king of Hungary. This was a major turning point in Central Europe because, say, we are in the years of um, of, in fact, the late Ottonians. So a moment of great confirmation of uh, Western and Frankish and Roman and um, Catholic establishment um, in, in Central Europe uh, among these populations that, up, especially in the case of, of Hungary, up to you know, the previous generations had been quite um, turbulent and um, somehow, in fact, uh, destructive towards uh, the Western order, and that by which instead now were being encompassed. Um, a lot say about this if we wanted, if you had more time, but we have to get to the point. Um, Stephen himself had been raised as a Roman Catholic, right, and this had brought say, also in the previous generations, the Magyars to be Christianized mostly by Rome, right? Um, in the vast territories that they control, of course, there were Orthodoxes as well. Um, and there was an attempt by Stephen to actually keep together a bit all the parts of these uh, early Magyar empire, fundamentally, um, and Transylvania, I wonder why we talk about this, because Transylvania was ruled at the time by Stephen's maternal uncle, Gula, or Gula, that was, uh, in fact, a local ruler, uh, and uh, this name is actually a title, per se, right? the second highest in the um, 
in the Magyar Confederacy. Uh, and this tells you how, of course, Transyl how important Transylvania has been um, historically for the Magyars, given that not just in part uh, the Magyars had settled there and passed through there in their occupation of the uh, of the Pannonian uh, basin, um, but it represented a sort of shield from other semi-nomadic nomadic populations from the east, right, as a bulwark, right, as an area that was essentially more warlike and in this sense also probably more militarized, um, at least in the, say, the, the general attitude of the local population to keep um, these peoples out because it was more difficult to concentrate the um, power to to centralize from there, uh, and it um, it was covered in, in fact in, in forests. In uh, it, it was it had of course the the, the Carpathian ring uh, around that, and it was a bit of a uh, land on its own. And it was just between Hungary and this broader east of steps across the Carpathians. So you understand why it would be important for the Magyars to consolidate in the moment of the establishment of a proper Christian monarchy this also political territorial asset including Transylvania within the system um, and Stephen was actually not in very positive relations with his maternal uncle so that he actually uh, led an army into Transylvania against him who surrendered by the way without a fight right showing that there was also a general sort of negotiation and agreement possible because there was no way this was throughout all Hungarian history to centralize right to directly control um, the periphery right uh, to say occupy and, and directly rule Transylvania um, it, it, the, the, the kingdom was evolving as a feudal state etc so it was always a matter of decentralization and as we know uh, we've seen it in many videos the Hungarian realm was plagued by the say uh the the, the oligarchic um say autonomies and privatization of the system uh that came with that right um this expedition of of 1002 however made it possible um for Stephen to organize the Transylvanian Catholic episcopacy that had its center in Alba Iulia, right, Gula uh, Feherpar in, in Hungarian, I will be butchering the, the Magyar um, pronunciation, uh, but uh, this was a very important passage, it, it was the, at least the, the episcopacy was established uh, in 1009, right, when the Bishop of Ostia, by the way, so uh, one of the most important Roman Catholic suburbicarian dioceses, and sending their, uh, in fact, uh, the, the prelate as a papal legate, by the way, visited the Hungarian king and um, approved so the, the Transylvanian diocesan divisions and boundaries. The relevance is obvious. Essentially, um, together with the uh, evangelization of the country, uh, Stephen brought to the... Um, full inclusion, let's say, of Transylvania within this Catholic sphere, right, because this was, again, a more peripheral land, um, also with some Orthodox presence, and even some pagan one, actually, because, of course, these lands were pretty much far away from many things, that there, ha there already were Christians there, as we will see now, but it was important to assert that this district, right, pertained to the one of the Roman Catholic uh, administration. Right. Uh, there are interesting news about uh, Transylvania also on the military front that shows you how important it was to, to stabilize in general the region. According to the Chronicum Pictum, a very famous um, uh, source, as you know, for Hungarian history, also known as the Illuminated Chronicle, um, dating from the 14th century, at the court of King Louis I, much later in time, of course, uh, Hungarian medieval historiography is very fascinating. I had the pleasure of um, working with one specific um, source 
and I will talk about it that when I will make the video, the, the, the video series about uh, the Markfield campaign, etc. And uh, it's very peculiar because it somehow differs um, in the narrative, in the style, in the level of t- uh, criticism from the rest of t- what would become Western, say, Frankish Europe, uh, broadly meant. And there are lots of t- things put together, sometimes even very much exposed, but uh, at least the source tells us, and we have to go uh, with that together. We have what what is available, of course. That Stephen, the first, will also become Saint Stephen, as you know, defeated Ken, who was a ruler of the Bulgarians and Slavs in southern Transylvania. Right? Consider that, of course, the mm, there was at this point still you know, a Bulgarian uh, power. Right, more or less in trouble because of Basil II, that from Constantinople was, as you know, to carry out a very energic um, phase of subjection. Right, of you know, actually many years I made a video specifically about the cost of this war to tame uh, the what was the first Bulgarian Empire. I also have a mini series about the rise and fall of the second Bulgarian Empire, and I made a video about the first. Um, so, if you're interested, we will come back on medieval Bulgaria that has its own playlist on Schwerpunkt, of course. And I wish I covered really, um, say, Central, Eastern, Balkan, Europe in more sort of depth, and that's also why I make these videos, by the way. Um, and the uh, this uh, again uh, campaign of Stephen um, in the south of Transylvania is also relevant because it shows how they infiltrated other powers and other peoples, other say polities in a way or another, were in this in de facto frontier area like Transylvania. From the south, where as you know, in, in the south, further south, also across the Danube hand the extension of uh, Bulgarian power. Um, plus the, the other, of course, Slavic populations that had historically settled there. Um, medieval Transylvania was, this is particularly important, part or integral part of the Kingdom of Hungary as a whole. Right? As we said here, like uh, Hungary as a few really other um, powers in the Middle Ages, um, was not just an ethnic kingdom, it was something more, right? It it basically had an imperial control on many um many peripheral areas, um so much so that the in the fourteenth century, at the beginning of it a bit at the peak of um the medieval Hungarian power, as many at the time, uh uh counted among the monarchic possessions, uh, nine countries and provinces. The dissenter was, by extent, by the grace of God, King of Hungary, Dalmatia, Croatia, Rama, Serbia, Galicia, Lodomeria, Cumania, and Bulgaria. Right. So, naturally, most of these lands were just demanded as being part of the Hungarian uh, dominion. Uh, nevertheless, it is true that the Kingdom of Hungary was sort of the hegemonic power um, in in the region, and so that many peoples around, including the ones we list here, were de facto depending on w- what the Hungarian kings were doing. Um, actual rule, w- say, the direct one was exercised over Croatia and Dalmatia by the Hungarian king, that, however, was still represented in a decentralized fashion by the local bands um, placed at the head of these provinces. Um, so you had a, say, broader it's, it's internal core instead was the uranium in the sources, um, and Transylvania was essentially uh, included within it. So much so that it was not titled for this reason among the, the aforementioned countries. Right, this is the point. But it, it still was uh, a major one, 
right along the eastern borders. Um, that was Slavonia south of the Draba. And we'll come back on all these various polities in depth for with a video each. As we were saying before, the um, east brought various nomadic invasions. We will observe today. Um, Transylvania was invaded by the Pechenex, for example, during the same reign of Stephen. The Battle of Kerles brought to the Hungarian and Transylvanian victory over the Pechenex and the Uzes, Turks, the Alkuts, essentially, commanded by Azul. Right, uh, the Hungarians were led by the King Solomon, uh, who ruled from 1063. Um, and the Dukes Jedza and Ladislaus, that were uh, essentially part of the uh, royal entourage. We are in 1068, by the way, Transylvania. Uh, and the pattern is similar because essentially the, uh, the sort of permeable nature of the Transylvanian frontier was pretty fit for some uh, stratagems. Right, the nomads could enter in a relatively easy way, but once they had looted, right, and this area was relatively centralized from the Kingdom of Hungary, had the big deterrent power, could intervene in Transylvania, but let's say not having, as we've seen, that direct control, they would be burdened by the loot, and when coming back across the Carpathians towards the steppes, they could easily be blocked in the mountain passes and de facto exterminated because they would have not found another way back and uh, there wasn't uh, long to wait uh, before they, they exhausted their uh, the supplies. Now naturally you needed a coordination to do this with those that you know had uh, also initially perhaps let them in right because as we'll see now there is a, a of course a always a, a divide between the, the mountaineers, the uh, the shepherds, etc., and the lowland communities, so it gets blurred in terms of, of allegiance. But th this could be overall, as far as the, the Hungarian defense of the broader enemy was concerned, the, the dynamic, and it happened multiple times. And naturally, peoples like the Pechenegs, uh, the Ogots, etc., would um, be the sort of the weaker side, they hardly ever came in large, say, compact numbers could challenge, say, Hungarian rule in a broader sense. Uh, but they were, of course, a problem because the Hungarian control in Transylvania also depended on the capacity of defending the land, so that, as it is always the case. King Ladislaus I of Hungary, that ruled uh, from 1077, um, released the imprisoned former King Solomon at the time of the ceremony of the canonization of the first five Hungarian saints. And after his release, Solomon made a final effort to regain his throne. Um, he, for this purpose, invited a Kuman chieftain, so as Kuman Pechenex here are almost the same thing, um, Kutesk to invade the Renum, right? Promising this chieftain, by the way, that uh, he, um, as say the future Hungarian king, would give him the right of possession over Transylvania entirely, and would even take his daughter as a wife. So essentially, making a, a broader royal marriage and elevating of uh, this guy to unprecedented power, right? Um, this was actually just a desperate uh, bid, right? King Laudislaus defeated both Solomon and the invaders in 1085. But this is a, this, uh, an interesting dynamic because the, the idea, after all, that this uh, other no nomads could settle, local lords, etc., was somehow um, a way of, uh, say, buying something in exchange. But, say, rendering it a plausible thing in an area could be somehow destabilized uh, in spite of the presence of course of as we will see now um, different groups that expected indeed uh, at least the, the Hungarian kings to protect them as long as they had to pay tributes to them. 
So how represented was Transylvania, say, before the 13th century, right? Because, as we've said, Hungary is documented also in a different way compared to the rest of Europe, generally less, right? And we look when we look especially at these more um, peripheral areas, that, that's even less, of course, because they were, say, um, sparsely populated, somehow less connected and less urbanized areas, especially up to that point, right? Two... Um, uh, mentions to references uh, about Transylvania date from the 11th century. In the 12th, that is a moment of great uh, acceleration say, of European uh, civilization, we have definitely more. And of the known Hungarian documents, overall only 16, however, reveal the name of some Transylvanian um, uh, lay or ecclesiastical dignitaries such as, I don't know, a bishop, a dean, a voivode, uh, or a count. We'll see who these figures precisely were in the local administration. It's really in the 13th century, however, that we start, and it's particularly after the, uh, the, the health of it, that we get really a lot of stuff about Transylvania that can tell us much more about what was going on also uh, about the the previous centuries because not just aside from the histories um also from, from other countries that talk about Transylvania but the uh, of course the the local society hadn't radically changed all of a sudden so more or less what was happening at that time can be reconstructed relatively for the previous times and the multi sort of ethnic background of, of this country is very apparent. Uh, we start from the Shekelis, right? Uh, this group of um, a- allegedly Hunnic descent, right? There is a sort of Hungarian topos, right? Also in, in royal historiography concerning this sort of different, like we descend from the Hans, it's just like, you know, uh, the Kaiser during World War the first telling the Germans that they were actual Huns, right? And people today think it was just a, a smearing uh, of the Allies. No, they literally wanted to be believed like the Huns, or ex- expressly for the extermination of people. That this was, the, and the Hungarian imperial culture is uh, radically based on such concept. All right, the Magyars maintained this sense of greater sort of brutality in the sense of political culture also as a deterrent and as a way of saying we, we really are uh, something different. This is this is deeply felt. Uh, think about Sarmatism in Poland, for example. There are many, let's say, reasons why these countries came up, especially from the oligarchy with those with those ideas. In any case, the Shekelis are really, in fact, um, a people on their own. Um, and the, uh, Hungarian medieval chronicles tell the story of essentially a contingent of Huns remaining in Transylvania, which overall is not implausible, right, regarding, say, the, the, the groups that during the migration era had orbited around the Carpathian ba- Basin, because, as you know, that encloses fundamentally in the west of Transylvania the only, essentially the westernmost part of the Eurasian steppes, and so if you look at the Huns, if you look at the Avars, the Magyars, they would settle there, but also, say, other sort of um, steppe-influenced Germanic peoples, like the the Ostrogoths or the, the Longobards, the Gepids, especially, that in great part also remained there after they were set in part, um, taken away uh, by, by the Longobards. Um, into Italy. So, um, the story goes, these are legions fundamentally, it cannot be de- fully demonstrated, but the idea is that these Huns of Transylvania would have eventually allied themselves with the Hungarians, arriving, um, conquering the Carpathian Basin uh, in the 9th century, so th- this would make the, the Shekels also being part of, of the conquerors themselves, because apparently of the sense that were the step, original steps people. That's, naturally, things went in a very different way, but it, it is, uh, at least compared to the the, say the, the, the edifying meaning of the story uh, for this group, uh, but it, it is true that there were lots of people doing back and forth, any part remaining there, and some maintaining their steps, uh, customs. This would happen throughout 
um, the the same Magyar uh, ethnic hinterland, right, core land, especially in fact in the steppes areas that wouldn't uh, say maintain more than in fact what these steppe groups uh, could could live like. Um, and naturally, the Shakilis are a bit of a more complicated story. We'll make a video just uh, on the roll. Right. In any case, several medieval Hungarian chronicles claimed that these people descended from the Huns, from the anonymous of the Gesta Hungarorum, uh, to uh, Simon of Kedza, the guy that actually worked on in his Gesta, in fact, Unorum et Ungarorum. Right. So, in that sense, st stressing also the proximity of the Hungarians with, with the Huns from his own. Uh, 13th century perspective. There is also Mark of Cult, who was the author of the Chronicum Pictum, right, uh, and the canon of the Basilica of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin, and the chronicler, as we've seen, uh, uh, of um, the same King Louis the First of Hungary in the 14th century, in Angevin times. Also, Johannes um, Turozzi. Uh, Hungarian historian of the 15th century, an author, in fact, of the Latin Chronica Hungarorum, uh, re, um, let's say, let's say accepts the, uh, the the Hans uh, as the origins of the Shekelis. And there are some interesting passages about this, but of course, they knew relatively few about this whole idea, so also all the ethno-linguistic considerations here we skip because it's not a video just on the Shekelis. Their importance, however, lays in the fact that their somehow more primitive lifestyle that may have, in fact, been connected with sort of surely heavy step bias that the Shekelis still maintain in many ways in their culture, in their identity, uh, in their language, um, was particularly functional for the defense of the uh, of the Transylvanian frontier and as such of the one of say the, the, the border of the kingdom of Hungary throughout history throughout as we will see now different people but later on also against the Ottomans right so true guards of the eastern border of the Hungarian Renum that uh, lived on with this uh, sort of Hunnic legacy um, carried within themselves. Uh, another very famous group as far as Transylvania is concerned uh, are the Saxons. Right? Uh, these were literal Germans known as Saxons as a synecdoche. This doesn't mean that they were actually from Saxony as a wall and who are part of the broader Ost Zidlung that we documented in other videos. Uh, Legion goes that the Siebenbürgen that is to say, the German name for Transylvania as a whole, would derive from, in fact, these seven principal uh, fortified towns founded by the Transylvanian Saxons uh, back uh, in the day. The uh, presence of the Germans in Transylvania is witnessed uh, already around the 60s of the 12th century, when the King of Hungary, Jedza II, established their villages, having called them from the Rhineland, that was, as you know, one of the most tumultuously growing uh, regions in Europe, the, essentially the, the most prosper uh, in Germany as a whole, and that, however, just like um, a bit throughout all the 12th century, was expanding also because literally the local resources were relatively limited for the demographic um, um, expansion, the, 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 the capacity of local support. So um, the Hungarian kings had always, say, been fairly open, especially after the, in fact, probably the, the kingdom was established, to foreign elements settling in the country to counter the power of the oligarchs, right? So that these foreigners being sort of isolated in a in a sea of 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 local um, natives would be depending chiefly on the kings and so 
more devoted on them. There were also economical reasons because these German uh, merchants, knights, farmers were, say, coming from a this broader Western um, Frankish sort of updated uh, world of feudalism that brought together with itself important ways, let's say, fashions of, of land exploitation that, uh, that maintained, by the way, a contact with the broader markets um, and that were very well organized according to their uh, communal, in fact, laws that would be eventually recognized by the, the same Hungarian kings. These settlers were established in villages between the Alt and Kukula rivers, so in the very heart of, of Transylvania. Um, the Germans were known also as hospitas, right? Um, in especially the north of uh, of Transylvania, as they were established in the very royal estates of Radna and Besterze. Such colonization was carried out by some arist German aristocratic figures, known in German as Kreves, so uh, technically counts, right, uh, the Hungarian equivalent being Jerebs, right, and uh, being called, in fact, by, by the, the natives like that. So these Jerebs would receive by the king of Hungary some specific judicial, administrative, and martial prerogatives, to rule over these um, connational communities of Germans. And uh, these counts essentially obtained also a hereditary status as far as these privileges went, which um, gradually would bring to the uh, Grefes, in fact, to be, to be assimilated among the Germans, especially in the 13th, let's say, to the broader Hungarian nobility, right, so to the, um, to an establishment that was gradually separated from the same German com towns now that were acquiring a sort of individual identity opposed to the feudal one, so also the ethnic, um, let's say, proximity there was separated by the, the social uh, status divide. Um, Interestingly enough, already in the 13th century, the um, Transylvanian Saxons were ruling in two districts uh, mirroring the Shekelis organization. Right? The basis of such administration was led for the Germans by Andrew II, um, king of, of Hungary, between 1205 and 1235 in the so-called Diploma Andreanum, or in German, the Goldener Freibrief der Siebenbürger Sachsen, that is to say, the uh, Golden Charter, right? Freibrief is literally the, the letter of freedoms, right, of, of the Saxons, of the, of the seven towns, of the Siebenbürgers of, of, of Transylvania. Um, in, we are in 1224. This Andreanum was diploma was particularly important because it ended on these communities the supervision of the voivode that we will see better uh, what kind of figure it really was, um, giving the same job um, to um, the span. There's also a, a relatively equivalent of of the count in Sheben. Uh, there, um, this um, figure essentially had the capacity of royal judgment uh, in Hungarian. It's Kira uh, Libero, all right? I presume if I pronounce it correctly, at least. Um, and it um, essentially allowed the German towns to develop uh, through the uh, various. Uh, judicial elections and also the ones of the local priesthood um, to uh, to affirm their own their own fact rights right their own prerogatives uh, in turn right so much so that 
this would be called the Scherben Fried. The area of the aforementioned Besh Terze um, in the north, which takes name from the river, could also enjoy these freedoms, right, separated from the one of the Sibenburg and in the south from 1366 onwards. Naturally, the Saxons had to pay taxes to the Hungarian king as subjects of the land, um, but this was a more direct connection, it wasn't essentially much of another feudal, feudal figure in between, if not say, um, a milder one, right, these guys were traditionally free, so they were relatively, um, say, more autonomous from other oligar uh, oligarchic figures other than the king. The tax had to be paid every year on St. Martin's Day, that is November the 11th. Also, 500 German militas were recruited into the Hungarian army. It was really enlisting people from everywhere, but Germany was in, in Western Europe, but Germany was, of course, more connected with the stabilization of the Hungarian kingdom. It was closer. Uh, geographically, so you, you find mostly Germans and Italians in, in the Hungarian kingdom as far as the Westerners went, but we, you had Englishmen, you had Frenchmen, you had Spanish, uh, etc. Um, these knights were to eventually be at some point rewarded by the Hungarian king as vassals with some fiefs, again, all with the function of countering, relative, at least initially, the, uh, the native uh, and nobility that these guys however on the longer run would have blended um, uh, in uh, any way. Consider however that the Saxon colony was managed um, to, to, to this end right of provision of uh, German knights by the local Saxon count that had to recruit and train the German militas. Uh, this is fascinating because it's sort of microcosm on its own that can provide an important amount of troops as well. Uh, so you understand here not just merchants uh, in a broader civil sense but the, the entire pack, right? And naturally Transylvania was still a place that say you couldn't simply, well okay let's go settle from the Rhineland <laughs> into Transylvania and of course, it's not that the Rhineland was particularly peaceful just per se, but of course, you know, going at the fringe of, you know, of the Kingdom of Hungary with, uh, say, st nomadic steppe warriors, uh, incursions and sort of ethnic tensions and, you know, rebellions and issues of this kind is it, still a play, it is still a condition, let's say, in which you want to, um, say, you would maintain a military character there. This is, again, a... Uh, very relatable thing because more or less as we will see now the other communities were sort of um, militarized in similar ways but this was say more strictly western in in face uh, right the towns as we were saying before got essentially free over time uh, of, of the Jarab's influence not much because they were particularly powerful per se, but because the latter had essentially blended into the Hungarian nobility, right? And, and so they rendered relatively indistinguishable and operating at a higher level that in, in the feudal hierarchy is, is looking also more in a more distant way instead the townsman is just a guy who lives there, right? Um, this favored essentially the Saxon communities to become uh, more more autonomous. Right. This is true not just for the town as such, but also the, the peasants that lived uh, around it. Right? Because they weren't just townsmen as colonists, but of course people working in land outside. Right? Because you know, the, the towns could have not existed otherwise. Um, of course, these centers became important markets where the agricultural um, goods could be sold from. Um, and they would remain quite active and somehow prosper uh, later on. You know, there were the same legions from 
Vlad Tepes concerning the, the figure of the German merch. Actually, the Black Legion of, say, Count Dracula is is stemming from the bad press, let's say, that um, that this, in fact, uh, uh, Vlachian leader suffered from the German towns that were somehow less liberal and than the the local Romanian um, lords uh, that were very much warlike and feudal and sort of uh, authoritarian. So that's the reason why eventually we got through uh, Bram Stoker, uh, the say the figure of the guy, because the the Saxons added a bit that there, there is a beautiful novel. We will talk about it when we talk about him. Uh, I want to make something about Valakia soon again too. That uh, that that are also mocking the same Saxons, only the truth, because there was one merchant that complained that uh, um, uh, at, uh, say some some fruit had been some oranges had been stolen right and um dracula had all the origins oranges except one uh brought back so justice was practically made but the saxon that was somehow a, gr- a greedy merchant um said but there is one orange left i don't know maybe the the guy who had recovered it had eaten one and and dracula said something like you know uh, if you don't get out of here, I will cut your head off. Because be thankful that there is here a functional justice that can administrate. Go back with your oranges uh, like you came from. Um, in any case, this merchant citizenry is really a thing um, in the Saxon communities. Uh, the towns gained the right, for example, to tax cargoes. Considered that one of the secondary branches of the Silk Road passed through uh true true Valachia telling the truth but still it branched further into also across the Carpathians um in fact this cargoes we're talking about contain expensive eastern goods that arrived to Hungary and Hungary always maintained a very strong connection throughout all its history um with the Middle East you would think it's strange but we see literally from the times of the Ugrafinic migrations of the Magyars were massively to say the least influenced by um, Persian Arab um, uh, polyorcetics for example the Magyars were uh, advanced in that regard were not just the, the typical steppe people not just because the Ugrafins emerged from the forests and the mountains rather than the steppes but because they had received also this further influence and later on especially in the high middle ages the same ones we're talking about today they had, we will see it, I've described it in part in the, that video about Hungarian warfare during this period, more or less, significant influences from places as far as the, the Caucasus, the Caspian Sea, Iran, uh, and so on. And of course, the Saxons played a bit like the trade middleman uh, in this picture. Um, their wealth allowed them, by the way, two higher mercenaries, given that also the knightly elite, as we've seen, had sort of taken off her being somehow more aristocratic than a townsman. Um, Because, of course, the folk is not particularly militarized and or effective not just to defend uh, the fortified town. Um, The the count post uh, would, in fact, function more like a like a, essentially a financier of some sort rather than a feudal lord and it was taken over by the mayor of Zeben by the way and the mayor was chosen by a urban council of 12 people who came for, in turn from yet another council of 100 so you see a sort of more popular system the most powerful officials of which were the royal judge and the mayor both from the aforementioned Sheben was also the Church of Transylvania um, that, as we've seen, dated back to the beginning of the 11th century. Some counties in the south uh, were attached to the mm, provostship of Sheben, others to the bishopric of Gulafervar. All right. Um, another German presence in Hungary, famously enough, and I made a video about that too, but we really have to make much more about them were the Teutonic Knights, famously enough. Um, in 1211, Andrew II of Hungary called also 
the Teutonic Knights from the uh, from the Holy Land, right, from um, Acre, specifically in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, right, this was the order of brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem, formed to aid the Christians on pilgrimages to the Holy Land, and um, in order to settle part of them in Transylvania as vassals, right, um, especially in the Burzen land, that is the Tsara Birse, um, yet another historic and ethnographic area of southeastern Transylvania, uh, in order to counter the Kumans, right, so this, again, Turkic peoples that lived um, far east uh, across the the Eurasian steppes, starting from the uh, outer Carpathian foothills, and sometimes in, say, into the Carpathians themselves. Because, um, of course, uh, as we've said, these groups, these war bands, were sort of uh, destabilizing a bit um, the area, they were rendering the trade uh, unsafe and, and more. Uh, the problem is that the Teutonic Knights were so effective that they began to they settled in Hungary, but they began, and they were not a big order at the time yet, but they expanded so much outside the same Transylvania without the royal authorization that King Andrew II expelled them in 1225. This is fascinating because you get the, those who had the means at this point, say, uh, Western chivalry has really the the top moral and technological edge everywhere, and so uh, the Teutonic Knights, as all these uh, monastic orders, um, military monks, were designed essentially to exterminate large amount of people just by design, which is what the military is, thank God, called to do, but. In, in this ultra elite sense, right? These guys would have had to take down tens of people before being taken down, at least on average, in, in various clashes. Um, and that was their mentality, that was their drive, that was their spiritual preparation. And they began literally to, to, to take over the area because, of course, they were unmatched. They acted at that point as lords, even though they were very well organized. As a, this, this is the advantage of a monastic state, such as the one that established in the Baltic, that was one, in fact, of the more politically concentrated for medieval standards of government uh, in Europe at the time. And uh, the, the same kings freaked out because they said, if these guys expand, we can't dislodge them, especially from Transylvania, from the Carpathians, from there. And so oh, let's send them home. Uh, we mentioned before the, um, the figure of the Voivode, uh, which uh, is essentially, as you know, in um, it has various spellings, but it's to make the long story short, it's a title denoting a military leader, warlord in the broader say, Slavic world, like in Central, South, uh, say, essentially Balkan and, and Eastern um, European um, world. Um, and the Transylvanians would have uh, a void vote uh, on, on, on the road, right? One over ru ruler fundamentally. The title appears in Transylvania in 1193, and before that, there was the term Ispan, was used as we've seen for the chief official of the Alba county. Transylvania, however, came under a boybot recognized as the as such, like for, for the entire land, only after 1263. Um, this occurred as essentially the consequence of the abolition of the counts of Sholdnok, that is Doboka, and Alba. The Voivod controlled seven counties, and according to the Chronicon Pictum, the first one of Transylvania was Zoltan, the same person as the great grandfather of Saint Stephen. This is a legendary figure, and it's also highly unlikely that he was the same guy because there are, he would have had to be so long living to be, uh, by the way, continuously in charge 
in such a position and whatever. So um, say there are various speculations about whom he was, right? But ideally, this this figure had already been existing from that long uh, back in time. As part of the Kingdom of Hungary, Transylvania, given also our eastern location, was first invested by the Mongol invasion. Uh, in 1241, the kingdom was invaded by Guyuk Khan, the third Khagan of the Mongol Empire, the eldest son of Ögöde Khan and the grandson of Genghis Khan, um, f- uh, from the Oithuts Pass, that is essentially from Moldavia into Transylvania, while Subotai, the you know, primary military strategist of Genghis Khan and Ogode, um attacked the south from the Media Pass through Orshova, that is a port city of the Danube um, in uh, today's southwestern Romania's Medinci County. Uh, so Batai advanced northward to meet Batu Khan that had been operating in Poland. If you're interested, you can check out the video about medieval Silesia and all the others about Mongol warfare, by the way, and Polish warfare as well, because it's quite momentous, momentous time you have to make a video about the Battle of Lenitz, uh, Lenitz of course. Um, uh, Guyuk attacked um, Hermannstadt, um, Najis Szeben, in Hungarian, Sibiu, in Romanian, to prevent essentially the Transylvanian nobility from aiding Bela, the fort of Hungary. Um, so essentially splitting the country a bit uh, in two, right, uh, and uh, avoiding uh, the reconjunction of the various forces of, of the realm. Uh, the Sterze, Kolschwar, uh, and the Transylvanian Plain region were devastated by the Mongols. These are essentially the the lowlands, right, in, of um, of Transylvania in the very core. Um, that, as you know, is surrounded by by the mountains. The Mongols uh, were careful uh, through such passes because they knew, and that that. Uh, things could get uh, could get wrong uh, also in the advance, but of course they were very competent. In the in the addition, um, the Mongols um, ravaged the King Silver's mine at Rotna, in uh, also in Transylvania, and this was a public uh, domain asset. So um, that tells you how and why also among the various reasons the Hungarian kings took care of the communities of Transylvania to protect these important resources. Yet a, a separate Mongol force destroyed the western Cumans that were inhabiting the Sirret River that rises from the Carpathians uh, in the northern Bukovina region of Ukraine and t- today flowing southward into Rom- Romania before joining uh, the Danube. In the process, the Roman Catholic diocese of Cumania, that was this fact Latin Rite bishopric west of the Syret River uh, from 1228, was destroyed. Essentially, the Mongol invasion cancelled this bishopric, um, and the consequences for the region in general were really devastating. Right? Some estimates go as far as saying that half of the population of Transylvania essentially uh, disappeared either by massacre or plausibly more just for uh, emigration due to the Mongol invasion. Right, Some estimate a 15%. Uh, indeed, you cannot simply dislodge people that easily. Right, but surely this was not a overwhelmingly developed area, so they would have suffered the crisis in in a tougher way. At least the recovery capacities were more limited, infrastructurally, locally, etc. Um, so this didn't help, uh, of course, in the broader development of uh, of Transylvania. Even though the Kingdom of Hungary was quick to recover from the Mongol invasions. 
the Cumans, by the way, converted more uh, widely to Roman Catholicism after this uh, the devastation because they somehow were becoming more dependent on uh, the Hungarian kingdom and the ecclesiastical administration. Many of them sought refuge in central Hungary. Some, as we've seen, already inhabited the country. Others were refugees that the Hungarians had just settled recently uh, across the country. Um, Elizabeth the Cuman was the queen consort of Stephen V. Um, and uh, she, she was a common princess, right? Becoming the mother of the future King Ladislas IV, known as the Kuman. Right. It is the guy from Markfeld, by the way, that I was somehow closer to for that reason. Um, the uh, Mongol invasions, by the way, of uh, Hungary and of Transylvania were not over, right? Nogai Khan the general and king maker of the Golden Horde and the great great grandson of Genghis Khan um, in 1285 with Talabuga that was um, yet another ruler uh, would become at least of, of the Golden Horde after him at the time in general right led the invasion of in fact the Hungarian kingdom. Talabuga led a force into northern Hungary, but was stopped at the time by the heavy Carpathian snow. This gave the Hungarians more time to prepare, uh, and in fact he was defeated near Pest by the army of King Ladislas IV, and ambushed, by the way, by the Shekelis in retreat, in, in that uh, old trick right of, of blockading the passes right like let them in then in order to get out we'll you know we'll see how they can get away with that um, in any case Talabuga's army did ravage Transylvania cities such as Regin um, in the Muresh um, and Brasov uh, Bistritsa were all plundered the Mongols were not particularly renowned for human sensitivity, so you have to imagine the extremely violent uh, situation here. In any case, lots of them ended up also um, cut down uh, in the process, right? They lacked, first of all, food, like operating in Transylvania is messy, right? And they were definitely confronted by the, the resistance of the locals, as you've seen the Shaklis, but also the Vlachs. Uh, and the Saxons, right? So these put up a uh, resistance. They managed to track and kill, isolate um, some hunted parties. And, uh, you know, uh, in part was a, a revenge. Benedict, the abbot of the church of St. Thomas of Estergom, wrote regarding the 1285 Mongol invasion that up to 26,000 Tartars were killed right so that had brought essentially um the at least this was uh, in the uh, victory inflicted to them at Pesh by by the king so that they fled eventually trying to escape from the hungarians they reached transylvanians but in fact the shecklists the blacks and the saxons blocked the roads with their scouts and surrounded them johannes long the uh, longus the Ypres, uh, also, Marino uh, Sanuto Torcello, this was a uh, rare author, like of the time, the latter statesman and geographer from Venice, etc., recorded themselves indeed that the Mongol invasion of 1285 86 um, saw the um, Romanian and Shekeli defense of the Carpathian passes. Right. And this. Um, this obliged the, the Mongols either to take other routes or to basically be trapped. In 1288, the Archbishop of Estergom, that is called Strigonius, by the way, in Latin, um, the Archbishop Lodomerius, the most important Catholic church figure from Hungary, um, and this is important because the south of Transylvania depended on this Archbishopric, right, that is distant from there, 
wrote, in fact, an epistle uh, to the Hungarian Saxon Shekely and Black noblemen from the counties of Sibiu and Borsa in Transylvania to disobey King Ladislaus the, the, the Fourth. Um, so not this happened for for other reasons that didn't have to do with them. It was the usual instability of of the realm for the aforementioned dynamics, not to provide him with any military aid, right? So there was a sort of spiritual leverage that the Archbishop um, of Estergom could make um, that far as Transylvania regarding the do not obey to the king, which was easy to do because, of course, in a frontier area, um, if you, you gave this guy's green light for further autonomization, it would, of course, seize the opportunities. So we mentioned the Vlachs, uh, the Romanians, you can say. That is uh, an interesting topic um, uh, yeah, as far as the Hungarian documentation from the 12th to 13th century is concerned. Because there are specific references in the land of Hungarians and Vlachs. Now, I made uh, some of the videos that get more views on my channel are about the, the issue of the, of the Vlachs, of how you know, the, the, the theories about the uh, romanization of this land, the continuity of the Romance language in these areas. So, of course, there were some uh, Romanized populations throughout the centuries. That This was an area not being Romanized in a radical way for which we can say, oh, well, look, you know, they always kept speaking Romanian. Everybody was Romanian. As we've seen, there were many other groups um, that they we didn't even mention, but it is true that, especially the mountaineers, the practicing uh, transhumans, etc., all across an enormous area of the Balkans and Central Europe did speak essentially a Romanized lands, because essentially from the Aegean watershed, of course, the main influence had historically been Greek, but all along the Danube, technically, also in what had been the eastern half of the empire, the, the Lyrican, etc., um, the languages were Romanized. I mean, still today, even among the Slavs of the region, etc., you, you see that there are lots of terms that stem from essentially Romance, and that was obviously a legacy of uh, Romanization back um, in ancient times. So, since, again, we're not overwhelmingly documented about this region in Europe for self-evident reasons, and, let's say, uh, there is all this sort of ethnic mosaic, we can say, of different populations, it's important to track for a region that would eventually be Romanian, let's say the black presence. In 1213, uh, right, there is an army of blacks, Saxons, and Pechenegs, led by the Count of Sibiu, um, the Count, the, the Sibiu would be Ermannstadt, right, Sheben, right, the aforementioned here, you can change the, the term depending on what language you want to use, but that's part of the deal. Joachim Turje, right, this was a nobleman, a Hungarian nobleman and soldier from the, from the first half of, of the 13th century, serving as the Count of Hermannstadt around 1210, right, and it was also the forefather of the Schentgrotti uh, noble clan, right, attacked from the north the second Bulgarian Empire, I recorded this in the video about the topic, um, so we're talking about a black Kuman Bulgarian system. Even there, the Second Bulgarian Empire was somehow composite because there were groups from Wallachia, from even uh, even Transylvania and other lands, such as Moldavia, etc., or even more far away, that contributed to sort of revival against uh, the Byzantines, etc. And the Count of Shaban uh, attacked the fortress of Vidin that is one of the most important in the in the second Bulgarian empire right on the southern bank of the Danube in northwestern Bulgaria today um, and after this there were essentially um, Romanians, Romans speaking soldiers um, from Transylvanians documented in for all the Hungarian battles fought in the Carpathian region. So this is interesting because it shows definitely that there were blocks there uh, from quite a while. This would be scattered across like 
Transylvania, Moldavia, Wallachia, etc. And even, again, other areas historically. And during the 13th century, they become more apparent, right, in the sources. I made a video about the black infantrymen, by the way. They, these guys lived apparently on the outskirts of the world, as we will see uh, now, um, because they were mostly, again, shepherds, right? And that's part of the reason why they probably were not also that documented, because one thing is having a town or some sort of uh, more compact polity that has sedimented on an ethnic basis, even as an island, but the surroundings can be uh, populated by other peoples. And the 13th century is a moment of great growth for which not just you can have more documentation, but you can essentially look at um, at these communities expanding and gradually uh, you know, being ever more relevant. Right? There is a, an Hungarian royal charter from 1223, uh, which constitutes the first info on the Romanians in Transylvania. This is uh, related to the uh, monastery of um, Kerch, that is um, Kirta. Is a, essentially, it was at least a, uh, a Cistercian monastery in the south of Transylvania. And the charter mentions that the blacks owned the land when the monastery was founded which is also particularly fascinating because it was they were being recognized that of course they had rights uh, on on that land anyway um, and according to the diploma andrianum that we mentioned before the transylvanian saxons were entitled to use certain woods together with the vlax and the pechenegs so as we've seen we are in the time of andrew the second um, the document is in 1224 and this was also a sort of normal practice in the middle ages where different communities that shared the use of um, forests that were originally some sort of the the manual possessions or at least the, the kings tend to expand their as we've seen before the silver mines etc they, on these assets of sort of public control and they were very important because they produced lots of resources. You could feed the pigs in the forest. You can get wood, right? You, ha you can hunt. So the, the nobility especially is quite jealous of these prerogatives. And um, this the, the Andrianum allows the Saxons and the Blacks and the, and the Pechenegs to share these particular woods um, together. In 1252, King Bela IV of Hungary for his services in various foreign embassies, Don donates to Vincent, it was the commiss of the Shekeli of Sebus, the land called Sek, uh, between the territory of the Vlachs of uh, Kirch, that is uh, the aforementioned Kirch, uh, Kirsta, Kirsa actually, um, and uh, the Saxons of Brashov and the Shekelis of Sebu, this land once belonging to a Saxon estate called Fulkun, right, but that had gone depopulated essentially after the Mongol invasion. So we see definitely a, an expansion also of these. Uh, I mean, if the Mongols had d destroyed the plains, right, those who inhabited in the mountains tended to descend. Uh, after this, and it was not a big deal for them that these lands had been devastated because there were better lands than the ones in which they historically inhabited. And the blacks, again, were also that, as we've seen, sort of warlike as far as this uh, terrain knowledge of some more obscure communities, um, how people were concerned. Um, quite effective at defending themselves. In 1256, King Bela IV, given that the Archbishop. Benedict of Estergom had complained um, about this confirmed the right of the archdiocese to the tithes from mining wages and from animal taxes collected from the Shekelis and the Vlachs to the uh, sovereign or anyone else among the um, legal accommodation and taxation privileges of the archdiocese except for the lands uh, rented by the Saxons but also from the Vlachs everywhere and from anywhere they came. In 1290 Andrew III of Hungary 
granted three Hungarian landowners from Hunyad in the essentially in the in the south, also the the border with uh, Wallachia and the Fair County, uh, the right to invite black laborers into the county, in fact, from south of the mountains, so essentially from Wallachia, right, uh, in the south of Transylvania. This is also part of the dynamic that brought further romance elements into there. About Wallachia we know even less, because those were lands that, um, well, of course, the name tells you a lot, um, and I made a video about the origins of the establishment of Wallachia proper, even as a polity on, on its own. Um, but it was sort of more ravaged area, it was more open, right, on the Danubian plain, it's where all the nomads arrived more easily, right, the Transylvanians um, were much better sheltered, right, by the Carpathians. In any case, you realize there is a need to, um, to settle further people, further manpower, further labor force, and the kingdom was, of course, uh, engineering this. In the spring of 1291, in Alba Iulia, the King Andrew III, that would be also the last of the Arpad dynasty before the essentially the Angevins established um, the country, convened and presided over a council consisting of the uh, representatives of all the nobles, uh, so intended as the Hungarian ones in this case, the Saxons, the Shekelis, and the Blacks. Right? It says in Latin is explicitly, cum universis nobilibus saxonibus siculis and Olakis. It's interesting how it, they spell them. This was the general association of all, essentially the the estates in Transylvania, right? You see, they were all represented fundamentally: the Hungarian nobles, the Saxons, the Shekelis, and the Blacks. Um, this uh, was held, by the way, uh, half a year after the General Assembly of the Hungarian Kingdom that unfolded at Buda, uh, which is also interesting because Transylvania was essentially the, s the second most important uh, region in, a, say, yes, in the west were others, but within the Renium, all right, and um, and it's sort of mirrored, like in the local politics and administration, how things worked uh, in the center of, of the kingdom. Um, so, in the 14th century, the most important Transylvanian figures were the Voivode, as we've seen, that was, say, uh, ruling over some Hispans, as we've seen. So, the Voivode is a sort of general figure in, com in control of the administration of the country. And the Hispans are more dedicated to the sort of the, the military control, right? in the various districts. Um, then you have the Bishop of Transylvania, as we've seen this institution from the 11th century, officialized by, uh, under the Latin rite, and then the Abbot of Kolos Monstor, that is at the outskirts of today's Cluid Napolza. Uh, this is a more feudalized time, and the reason um, why you see also just the, these three figures is that the feudal system has definitely intensified in the previous centuries and times. Uh, actually, that royal power has been eroded on the periphery because there are ever more oligarchs, right? Um, and so this, while equating to a sort of cooptation, also the higher level equates to this further delegation in local. The estates um, had as we've seen in the previous assembly, also consolidated on the basis of the so-called standard Latin general universitates, so literally the, the universities, right? So some communities that were, like the etymology of the term says, united um, towards a single aim, basically, all turned literally towards a single point, um, and that were acknowledged as such as estates, uh, having essentially a collective... Uh, liberties, privileges, uh, rights. 
they had their own political power, they controlled the local resources um, to the extent that this decentralized system from the monarchy uh, worked like. And as we've seen, they were divided by ethnic criteria, like the peoples we listed before. The Hungarian nobility, lay and ecclesiastical alike, um, that was actually also more composite, as we've seen some of before we were seeing a war of Saxon origin, and especially in Transylvania, you would find that greater concentration, at least from the what had been the the Zibenburg and and the let's say those colonies in north uh, uh, royal lands, um, and that was, however, homogenizing in a political, juridical, and cultural sense in a Magyar direction. Definitely, there is the famous Golden Bull of twelve twenty two issued by um, by Andrew II, which expresses essentially the constitutional limits posed on the monarchy. This is a great problem, as, as we've seen for Hungary, the Central European monarchies would fail to, to concentrate power like the Western ones. Um, at this time, just they were trying to, to, make, to, to make it out um, of this oligarchic mess. Um, the Saxons, the Sheklis, and the Romanians were also present, and in also in important demographic uh, terms. And they thus coexisted. That's how you can see them established uh, in the fully by the the thirteenth century, without say also historical uncertainties in the way we describe. The Black Law is quite important for the aforementioned reasons uh, as well. That is to say, um, the Romance population is a bit mysterious and apparently organized later compared to these other groups that are at least documented as such uh, from an earlier time. The Black Law essentially regulated the was the one, the, the common one, uh, owned by the, the, this Romance populations living in Central and Balkan Europe and practicing transhumance pastoralism. Um, and uh, such law with the, under which they disciplined themselves was to be recognized by the Hungarian kings as yet another, again, ethnicity that could be useful, after all, to counterbalance the other groups uh, in this sort of uh, concentration of power attempts. In Latin, Black Law is known as Jus Valacicum, which appears as such in the documents issued by the Royal Chancery of Hungary in the 14th century. And it obviously refers to the law followed by the Romanian people in the, in, in the realm of Hungary. It's, um, again, common law. Uh, it has similarities, of course, with the black law that established itself in those other political realities of Moldavia and Wallachia, right? Because we're all basically the same people, um, even in spite, of, of course, of the differences, the other groups that existed also in there. Um, and it was initially as such an unwritten law, that's also why we get um, less info about it earlier from this more primitive people uh, from from the mountains, etc. But it would exist, of course, in a, in a written form uh, as well, which was necessary for the royal authority to discipline it in the first uh, place in the uh, in the courts, right? If there was an issue uh, between a, a black uh, and anybody else, and this guy ap appeal as part of the community that, of course, would be hopefully heard. I mean, the average person didn't really have much representation in the system, but the entire community as such, yes, right? So um, that's how the system worked. Well, of course, the judges had to uh, dispose of a black written law in order to just uh, base oneself uh, themselves on a uh, on a fixed uh, rule, right? And of course, there was also a customary one that had been working 
um, in the same way through witnesses and so on. But for the royal decrees uh, in a country that was now substantially feudalizing and uh, going towards a more um, startled direction, in spite of the final shortcoming, uh, this um, this law was was uh, necessary to be known as spread. It seems that the black communities were used to uh, draw by sort the land that had to be eventually distributed to the community. This customary law would have originated from the ancient Roman habit, and it would find that it was known as sortus, right to sort. Still, it's also in English um, alone as a word. In Romanian, it's sorti, right? Uh, consortium, you know, that sense of a community that bro is brought together by the same fate, etc. And among these um, uh, shepherds, again, the thing would have been just repeating itself as they were moving, they were changing location often and or they they would move further to other areas, not just because of transhumans that still contemplate some sort of, you know, stability in one place and the other across the seasons. And, and these territories would be uh, uh, say this plot, but can imagine this uh, this land were known as falces in Romanian falci I, or falci, I don't know how it's pronounced um, and uh, the the neighbor in the falces was known as vici from the Latin vicinus and then there was a judge known as Judas in Romanian Yudzi, um, and this title would be, however, replaced by the Slavic word Gnets, um, that um, had been used uh, in these lands also in the previous centuries uh, in a very um, you know extensive way. And of course, these populations were all mixed with one another. Then eventually, like one. Uh, say language or the other would prevail in a certain community, but they were somehow similar. Uh, the Vlach law was connected to what would be known uh, historically as the Districta Valacorum, so the Romanian districts that uh, had been established in the medieval kingdom of Hungary as the administrative unit of the Vlachs specifically. And this for, these districts are mentioned for the first time in the 14th century. They are really becoming visible in the records, in the documents, uh, through legal practice, uh, etc. And the interesting thing, as we were saying before, is that the blacks were scattered a bit all over the, the lands of the Kingdom of Hungary. So this applied not just to Transylvania, of course, um, but again, the blacks were also outside of the Kingdom of Hungary, so we were just a, a population that had this sort of shared common background, even though they could be very different in practice. Um, but that they would concentrate, especially in this peripheral area, which makes sense for the aforementioned reason. I mean, a sort of the decentralization, the, the first devastation of the Mongols, the fact that these were a bit like the peoples had remained left around in the mountains, etc. So repopulating the, um, the lowlands. And of course there were some blacks that had, as we've seen before, just existed in more regular contexts, right? Not just as shepherds or mountaineers or whatever. Um, just they, re-incre- they increased um, dramatically at this point and their presence just by demographic growth and or uh, displacement of other groups due to the Mongol invasions, um, etc. Um, there is also a different usages of the legal terms that define these communities depending on the circumstances. So uh, about this we should enter a bit like in the juridical um, sort of specificities. We don't have the time. It, But what matters is, however, that the Romanian districts had this legal autonomy for which the members of the the communities would use um, a Romanian customary law protected by the Hungarian kings. Surely there was some Romano-Byzantine legal uh, traditional legacy 
uh, among the Vlachs, uh, but they were influenced also by the Hungarian, the Magyar customary law, the common law, uh, and uh, the Slavic one, and you know, more or less they had all been influencing one another um, throughout the centuries. Just the Vlachs were, as we've seen, generally speaking, less represented than the other groups originally, even though they were widespread. Um, more than 60 uh, Vlach districts are known to have existed in the Kingdom of Hungary alone. Interestingly enough, the Vlach communities hosted also Ruthenians, so Eastern Slavic populations. We've seen it in, in the video about medieval Moldavia, by the way. And within the Kingdom of Hungary, what is important is that the first um, the Vlach laws to be um, attributed uh, to recognize to any community was in, Tran in Transylvania, right? Then the blacks um, were recognized gradually, in part because they moved, in part because they were simply, you know, just growing um, and becoming more important within the kingdom in, in Upper Hungary. Um, uh, first, in the mountainous areas, as it was more traditional for them, Mostly shepherds lived in such villages with the black laws we were saying before, and according to such law, by the way, um, the these people there were they inhabiting in areas that were not particularly favorable to farming, just per se, right? They the, the reason why these communities were recognized, by the way, was to exact taxes from them. So from one side to during the 13th and 14th century, so generally speaking, the average person tends to fall under, say, a feudal rule, ever more so in the 14th. So the idea is that we pay to be recognized and we get some protection in exchange from from the kingdom. Uh, before this, it, w it hadn't even been necessary, which doesn't mean, of course, that the blacks weren't there, by the way. Um, and um, the... the, the um, there was all, a, of course, a mechanism that favored immigration of foreigners relatively to the degree of taxation was exercised. So since uh, the uh, Hungarians, as we've seen, needed to re repopulate some areas, it was uh, convenient for to, say, lower the, the taxes that the blacks paid just to make them come in this place and just to make them become subjects. Uh, when um, we look at the origin of black law, we see that the Kenneths, that is essentially the the Kniats, right, the the, uh, the, the Kniats, or ruler, acted in fact as a sort of a chieftain. Um, in, in this sort of establishment phase, also as a settlement contractor, receiving some uninhabited or sparsely populated land f with the permission of the king, which was necessary in this regard. It's not literally that there were lands where nobody existed. So these um, mechanisms could be at some point in positive and or like even just the nobility didn't necessarily like uh, these groups depending on which degree of autonomy they received from the monarchy. So that's the game. Um, and there was some sort of um, uh, dynastic nature of the Kniats as well, uh, because uh, the descendants inherited such uh, sort of ruling functions, especially as judges, in non-principal um, matters over the settlers, right? So... At a higher level, there were other authorities intervening, but still, of course, this village heads, right? The chiefs were um, had a a control o over the the clans, the, the people who made up these these communities. Um, naturally, the various groups were say varying in size. There were Kinesis with 300 families, that's pretty large, but also ones with barely four or five. So this really depends on the circumstance. We cannot quite generalize so simply. 
Um, initially, the vlogs, by the way, tended to be settled in the proximity of pre-existing settlements. It's rather from the mid-14th century that they founded independent settlements because at that point, again, the Black Death had depopulated further many areas. Um, and so maybe they actually settled in places that had already been inhabited before, but that now were suffering very much for the dem demographic crisis. And again, the sense that the mountaineer gains somehow sort of greater space um, in the moment of the crisis of the lowlanders is absolutely spot on. Um, the Hungarians were pretty clear in depicting the blacks as mountain shepherds. And this was, uh, say, something that would kept going on in the centuries. In the Renaissance, there was an official report referring to the blacks as those who literally kept the animals in the forests and mountains. You can't imagine what their life historically had been about, so in these uh, quite uh, magically ancestral areas of Europe, with all the violence, with all the brutality, the primitivity, the, the material poverty, etc. There was also the so-called Sheep 50th, the Quinquagesima Ovium, so the sheep tax, um, paid only by the blacks in virtue of the fact that they had a lot of sheep which constituted their main assets um, and the the reason why it was called quinquagesimas simply enough uh, the ship fifth did is that they had uh, the, the blacks had to pay this tax uh, through one ship out of 50 all right um, and of course the black uh, economy, especially in, in the mountains, was about subsistence farming. There was nothing essentially to tax the Romanians on their agricultural resources. Right? It just lived like that. Um, and contrary to the name of this law, not only the Romanians could be entitled to the black law. This is really normal in medieval law. You can essentially be another person wanting to become uh, part of that community that identified essentially from an ethnic point of view from a juridical one. Um, Ethno-nationalists will not be particularly happy to hear this, but that's exactly how it had been going on forever. I mean, you are you belong to one people if you are part of the community and you fundamentally identify juridic like you're judged as this guy or through the same law which could mean that you could maintain at some point your juridical identity but being disciplined by your choice through the law of another say if you wanted to make a contract in black law you could at some point but there were Eastern Slavs, Slovaks, Poles, Croats, and even Hungarians that were settled as Vlachs because they were undisciplined as a community under the Vlach law. And this was particularly convenient because, as we've seen at some point, these communities had a lower, uh, had lower taxes imposed on them. And so the poorer elements or the, say, the more marginated, the less successful could simply turn into blacks, right, and so uh, embracing sort of that new new identity. And this was really much normal at the time, right, at, let's say, nationalism and socialism, something born essentially in the 19th century, it wasn't much of, uh, people believed in the, in the worth of the individuals, how powerful a person was, right, uh, say, it's not that um, uh, an Hungarian nobleman identified the fact that he was primarily Hungarian. He identified in the fact that he was primarily a nobleman. That also was Hungarian, but of course he thought that an Hungarian peasant would a, was a subhuman being. And this actually was the, the case of pretty much the entire Central Eastern Balkan Europe, really, for centuries and centuries, which actually a very few hundred years ago, um, up to say even the last century so it, it's really mm, this is that world it's not wishful thinking fairy tales whatever about great deep but they they truly of course cared about the catholic imperial tradition 
uh, which is a completely, it, it's basically what existed in the world uh, everywhere until a few hundred years ago for lesser people today to pretend they're special just because they pretend they belong to a nationality instead they are absolutely worthless and in, in the face of God uh, and of earthly power something that people cared enormous much at that point and that today instead people make up conspiracy theories against but right? just see the, the cultural shift if we can call it culture what we're living in uh, at any level so Voivod, as we've seen, was the guy who owned uh, the authority over several uh, Knezes, that is to say, this uh, black chieftains uh, ruling over the single black districts. Um, and so he was a sort of more, um, say, above figure, right? We have from the 14th century sources confirming, confirming that wherever uh, Knez was uh, had a hereditary title, the voivodes were initially elected instead, right? And these guys could be, they were Romanians themselves, right? Um, so this was uh, allowed by the same Hungarian common law, by the way, which provided that immigrant groups would elect a leader from their own national rank so it's it's quite relevant relevant uh, the Shekelis and you understand it because if he had to rule locally he had to of course know how to right and even though you could try to control these people through other officials you say these had still especially at the time, they had the temptation of autonomizing themselves. It was not much of a problem, after all. There were very different dynamics, again, to the ones that um, the nation-state megas believe today. Um, these people were sometimes even more loyal than the Hungarians towards the king, right? So the Shekelis elected their captains and judges. The Saxons elected their magistrates, who worked, as we've seen, alongside even the royal court, also because they brought on the, the, the financial resources these other groups didn't quite have, because they were natives, and as we've seen, the situation was not particularly prosper in the region, compared to, say, uh, Germany in this case. The blacks had the voivodes. Um, ruling on the Knezes and they also tended over time not to be elected but to simply inherit their title dynastically. Uh, this is quite relevant because the voivode would become naturally later on the local nobility right? and the ruling over this, uh, the Romanian community is maintaining their own law, and so also rights in theory, even though again they feudalized. Um, and uh, but but it's important because there were around these areas some castellanies that were ruled by Hungarian aristocrats, and these could not infringe the, on the rights of the blacks, right? In the district courts, in according to the administration of the kingdom, you uh, say that you um, you would have seen the appointment for the rule of this this black areas, knances, but also priests, uh, even commoners uh, that were coming just to uh, just to have the rights, uh, say any legal issues to pay. Uh, evaluated and the courts follow the Roman customary law in rendering such judgment as we explained before. The judge of the resettled population is the settler Knyaz or his heir. The court of Hungarian royal officers uh, judge the Knyaz. Right? This is particularly important to understand how the legal mechanism of the um, of the villages of the black law function. One third 
of the amount of the fines imposed on the people went to the knyads. This is also medi uh, typically medieval, right? The idea who controls justice controls also the income, and it's a lot of money because these uh, controversies have to do essentially with wealth stolen, occupied, confiscated, illegally, etc. So, if you exercise justice, you you exp first of all you spend in order to have it. Um, carried out, but you also get some out, out of it, right? Um, the other uh, wealth that is uh, gotten from this from these fines is used by the entire community for their own needs, right? This within the villages. These communities could also commutate one tenth of their product in exchange for their public service. Public service. This is especially, you know, the case for the later times where you realize these communities were not to be dramatically. Well, maybe the blacks were more easily recruitable, but more as sort of there were militias that had to mobilize, etc. But generally speaking, after the mid 14th century, you have the people being ever more the the people and mercenaries, ever more the soldiery. Um, and um, so the idea is that you, these communities pay in money or whatever they had that could be commercialized um, in order to have somebody else fighting, right? It's much easier, right, just even for the kingdom in general. But again, the blacks were pretty, at least as far as the defense of their lands was concerned, were pretty, um, let's say, not recommendable to face, <laughs> uh, especially in that, uh, in that, on that terrain, which was terrifying, to say the least. The commoner Vlach, by the way, gave a royal fifth of their cattle, which is interesting. Um, in the early 14th century, there were 40 Romanian districts across eastern Hungary and Transylvania. Um, in the north, they arrived up to the Maram Ross County, which is exactly in the sort of northeast, right? Um, yeah, it's today northwestern Romania and western Ukraine. The Knyanses, by the way, were entrusted with the duty to populate private and royal estates alike, which um, highlights even more the demographic needs that the monarchy had, especially on this eastern frontier for which everybody had to settle and this population was sparse enough um, in say coming from the mountains etc not to constitute a big problem like entire groups like the Kumans at a point had settled in other areas etc. The uh, black Knezes, um as we said, established their permanent leadership de facto in, in the process as essentially black noblemen uh, subject to the Kingdom of Hungary. However, they were not really recognized as full nobility in the Kingdom. They, for example, were obligated to pay duties to the castle in exchange for their estates, which still sounded like, in fact, they were sort of lesser uh, lesser people overall, right? And they were not treated equally like, uh, say, the, the rest of the, the nobility by degree, but by status here, based on the fact that they were black. Um, and uh, you understand here the seniorial relation was being established, de facto, all right? There were naturally various differences in the contracts of settlement for which every community had different rules here. There were surely some blacks that integrated better even in the nobility, others that were more powerful, that had more political weight than the others. And we know that uh, to provide a single mounted warrior for guarding the Danube against um, invasion and to supply livestock, including the delivery of the ship Fifth Death, right? Uh, the uh, affirmation of the Nicnias was 
consolidate because they were to take care essentially of the defense of the community uh, the because the Valachians were creating problems to the Kingdom of Hungary had tried to extend a control on that too um, so there was a lot of infighting actually among this uh, with, between the same blacks as you can imagine as mobsters and the um, they had to manage transhumans because it was continuing and that would continue for centuries to impressive scale throughout all the Carpathians, the, the Danube Valley and also the surrounding areas um, and so in, in ensuring that the fifth death would be paid so you needed a figure, a shift and a ruler a, somebody really acting as a local lord, the lord of the district, in fact, and this is how the blacks were um, recognized, established, um, and um, fully integrated in the system that they belonged to actually from a much older time, but that up to this point had not been fully institutionalized within the Hungarian kingdom. So, in the future, we will talk about late medieval Transylvania as well. For today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.